Hello and welcome everyone to today's webinar. I'm um, really excited uh, about our topic and speaker today. Um, before we get started, I just want to do a couple of uh, brief announcements. Um, and for those of you who uh, don't know who I am, my name is Chad Sievers and I'm the um, program manager for Arkansas Building Effective Services for Trauma, or our best. Um, we're a state funded program at the UAMS Psychiatric Research Institute. And our aim is to improve mental health services for children who have experienced trauma from events such as abuse, natural disasters, or family separation. We work um, closely with child advocacy centers and other providers in the state to build trauma-informed mental health system. And we're probably best known for providing training to mental health professionals and treatments that are effective with helping children recover from trauma. Um, through this training, in addition to direct services, technical support, and outreach, in the community, we're helping transform the delivery of mental health services in Arkansas so that children and families who have experienced trauma can recover and move forward with their lives. Um, so just wanted to again, welcome everybody. And I'm gonna go over just a couple of housekeeping announcements and I'll introduce our uh, speaker here briefly. But um, during the presentation, we encourage you to use or to um, ask us questions. Um, just use the question feature, which is on the right side of your screen. Um, and uh, we'll be sure to try to answer those as they uh, come up. If you're interested in earning a CEU, just be sure to stick around to the very end. We'll have a code that's given. Um, if you happen to be watching this at a later date, um, we only award CEUs for attending live webinars. Um, and if you are watching this with a group, it's helpful to let me know who um, the person that signed in was so I can just verify attendance. Um, so we'll upload this, this webinar is being recorded, we'll upload it to our YouTube channel um, later. And if uh, this topic or other um, training things are of interest to you, um, be sure to like us on Facebook. That's probably where we post most of our um, uh, events there. Um, we also have a newsletter and you can just kind of um, find uh, more about us there. Um, okay, um, Dr. Shona Ray Griffith is an assistant professor in the UAMS Department of Psychiatry. Um, and one of the many hats that Dr. Ray wears is leading the women's mental health program here at UAMS. And a few of her current research interests include chronic pain disorders during pregnancy and substance abuse disorders in pregnancy. And I will stop there and um, just ask that you give a warm virtual welcome uh, to Dr. Ray, and we're interested in learning more about your topic. not letting me okay i have to click there okay i've got it hi guys um again i'm shauna ray griffith i am a psychiatrist here at uams in the women's mental health program and today we are going to talk about maternal substance abuse and how that impacts both pregnancy and infant and child outcomes before we get started, I have received clinical trial support from Neuronetics as well as Sage Therapeutics. I will not be discussing either of these topics today. If you do have any questions about it, please feel free to ask me and I will answer it. Um, I do want this to be conversational and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, I've timed it out and we've got a lot to cover in the next hour. So if you do have questions, feel free to ask them and I'll interrupt myself every now and then to make sure we're getting all the questions answered because I don't want anyone leaving um, without their questions being answered. So what are we going to talk about? So today we're first going to talk about maternal substance abuse, how big of a problem it is. Specifically, we're going to touch base on what the problem here is in the state of Arkansas since we're lo I'm located here. <laughs> um, and we're also going to talk about what really is the impact of maternal substance abuse on pregnancy as well as children. So before we get started, we're going to define substance use. And substance use is really just any use of substance, and then it falls under a substance use disorder. They're part of the DSM-5, the Diagnostic Standard Manual for Psychiatrists. There are 10 drug classes, alcohol, caffeine, cannabis, nicotine, opiates, um, inhalant, sedative hypnotics such as Xanax, stimulant medicine such as prescription Adderall, 
hallucinogens such as ketamine or otherwise known as special K. And then a group that is known as other, which is a lot of your bath salts or designer drugs. For the purpose of this talk, we are going to mainly focus on illicit substance use. So that does not include alcohol, caffeine, or tobacco. I may touch a little bit on tobacco and alcohol in pregnancy, but I'm going to primarily talk and focus on the illicit substances. So the ones, the, the most of the bottom row here, and then opiates and cannabis as well. So to have a substance use disorder, you have to have four major areas of dysfunction in your life. And that's really impaired control, social impairment, risky use, or pharmacological criteria contribute to your substance use disorder. And we're gonna go over these in a little bit more detail. Um, and then when someone is diagnosed with a substance use disorder, it's also diagnosed on a severity scale. And this scale is continuous. Patients can go from severe to mild to moderate over time. So what criteria do we need to meet for a substance use disorder? Well, interestingly, you only have to meet two of the following criteria that we're about to go over. So first, any of the criteria under impaired control, which is patients who take, you know, they're taking a lot more instead of two drinks, it's taking them six drinks to get the same desired effect. Patients who are trying to cut down, patients who have failed um, attempts at sobriety among themselves, or patients who have failed attempts at sobriety via rehab. Patients who spend a lot of time obtaining using or recovering from use. So I'll have patients who tell me, you know, I'm so glad I'm in this program for, you know, prior to this program, every day I spent looking for drugs. Um, I woke up, that's what I was focused on or patients who have cravings for drugs. So they really intense desire urge for the drug that they really cannot um, ignore. They have to act on these drugs. So those would be the criteria under impaired control. For social impairment, this is really, you're having problems fulfilling your jobs or school, they're failing classes at school. Um, you're having trouble at home with your wife or your significant other. You continue to fight over your alcohol use, yet you continue to still drink. Um, or the person who stops going to family functionings because, or doing hobbies, they quit their softball team or they quit their basketball team because they'd rather spend time using drugs. Risky use, this is where it's either physically or psychologically a problem and so yet patients continue to use. So these are patients who have drink and driving or the patient who needs a liver transplant who continues to drink alcohol. Lastly, we have the pharmacological criteria of tolerance or withdrawal. Interestingly, with the DSM-5, you no longer need evidence of tolerance or withdrawal to have a severe substance use disorder. And in fact, you cannot apply these criteria of tolerance or withdrawal to a patient who has a substance use disorder with a prescription substance. So if a patient you believe has a problem with opiates or benzodiazepines or some, say, a stimulant medicine such as Adderall, you can actually not use the criteria of tolerance or withdrawal to apply to their substance use disorder. They would have to meet the criteria in the other three categories. So why, so now that we've defined substance use disorder, what is the issue with women who have a substance use disorder in pregnancy? Well, first of all, they get pregnant more often than patients without a substance use disorder. The rate of um, pregnancy in the general population is about one and a half pregnancies in their lifetime. For the substance use population, they have about four pregnancies in their lifetime. Why is this? Well, one, there's a lot of factors that contribute to it. One is they are not using contraception. They use lower rates of contraception. Um, and another thing is when patients go through the cycle of use of active disorder and then sobriety. During that period of sobriety, their fertility actually starts to peak once they get sober and start taking care of themselves better. And 
We're not really sure of the underlying mechanisms of that yet. It hasn't really been researched out, but patients actually get become more fertile as they become sober. So this also increases their risk of becoming pregnant. When they do get pregnant, the unintended pregnancy rates are higher in the general population. About 50% of pregnancies are unplanned. In the substance use disorder population, this increases to probably greater than 80%. Um, and 80% is probably on the low end that I quoted here. It's probably a little bit higher than that. Now, I do want to caution. I'm not saying that women with a substance use disorder who get pregnant and it's unattended, it's unwanted. So those are two separate things here. To so women who get pregnant, yes, it may not, with a substance use problem, it may not be planned, but they still much, you know, they still want their pregnancy. They still want to take care of their babies. And this is often a time where people like me or obstetrical providers can intervene with patients. This also gives them a renewed sense of maybe this is a reason I need to get sober. I finally have a reason to, so let's do it. Um, so what is the problem? So most people do quit using substances when they become pregnant, but we still know that up to 5% of pregnant women report illicit drug use within the past 30 days. Illicit refers to the illegal drug use, not alcohol or tobacco. This is just related to illicit drugs. We also know that, interestingly, teen pregnancies have higher rates of substance abuse compared to other age groups of pregnancy as well as compared to non-pregnant teens. And what does this mean in the United States nationally? Well, we have about 4 million pregnancies a year. So this equals about illicit drug use is prevalent in about 200,000 pregnancies a year. Illicit drug use, if you include that, is about 1.1 million pregnancies a year. So let's look at specifically what um, what substances used among pregnant women. This was a survey done. It is actually 10 years old now. So it probably needs to be repeated, but this is the last known survey that I'm aware of with data. And you'll notice the, the bars are color coded. So the blue is your adolescent pregnancy. So you can definitely see here, they're using almost all substances at much higher rates than other age groups. 18 to 25 is the coral color, and then 26 to 44 is your lime green color. So one thing we notice about this is 18 pregnancies are higher. We also notice that cigarettes remain the most commonly used substance among pregnant women. And we notice that illicit substance use is the lowest among pregnant women when it's compared to alcohol and cigarettes. And we also notice that as women get older, their use of substances decline among in pregnancy. So what does that mean for pregnancy? So in this slide is mean, is um, referring to general substance use in pregnancy. So in general, these patients do have core inadequate or late prenatal care here in my office. We do treat pregnant women with substance use disorders, and we are often the first provider they see when they are pregnant. They often call our office before they call their obstetrical um, provider and get pregnancy care. Um, we've, our patients have also told us the first thing they know they do when they find out they're pregnant is they call the WIC office. The next thing they do is try to get treatment. So they often delay their prenatal care for many reasons. If they're actively using substances as well, they're often taking care of themselves inadequately. They're not eating correctly. They're not sleeping correctly. They're putting themselves in potentially dangerous situations. They're exposed to higher rates of domestic violence. Also, they have higher rates of infectious disease compared to pregnant women without substance use, which can have negative impacts on their pregnancy. And when it comes to studying substance use in pregnancy, it's really difficult to do so. And that's because patients who use substances, one, aren't aware of, of what they use completely. The other issue is they don't tend to just use X. They tend to use X, Y, and Z. Comorbidity um, is very prevalent. There are other 
medical risk factors also compound our ability to really study substance use in pregnancy. So a lot of the data that we talk about is compounded by a lot of these measures. And so a lot of the data is either small numbers or, you know, are the results truly there? Is it due to other confounding factors? And that's what we do in research. So how are patients supposed to be recognized with substance use disorder? So for the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, they recommend that all obstetrical providers become familiar with SPIRT, which is screening, brief intervention, and then referral to treatment. This is also commonly used in primary care clinics for a variety of problems such as depression. It can also be used for um, substance use that's here. So this includes universal screening of all pregnant women during their first prenatal visit, during each trimester, as well as during their first postpartum visit. How do you screen? Well, they recommend using a validated verbal screening tool. I've listed a couple examples here. There's the four Ps, the NIDA quick screen, and CRAFT. CRAFT is meant to specifically be used with adolescent pregnancies. We do not recommend urine drug screening to screen for substance abuse, and we'll get to those reasons here shortly. And then in the brief intervention, you provide feedback, you educate the patients on the impact of their pregnancy, and then you lastly, you refer them to treatment, which is probably the most important part. When doing so, it's very important to remain non-judgmental and approach these patients with a proactive, non-judgmental stance. A lot of them are very afraid to tell people that they're using drugs in pregnancy because they not only feel guilty about it, but they don't want to be judged by others. And they, you know, it, it obviously is probably not the best, the highlight of their day telling someone that they're pregnant and using drugs. So this slide is a very busy slide, and we're going to spend a few minutes on it, not into detail. But this is a slide that along the x-axis up here, it gives you the exposure during pregnancy. The y-axis here gives you multiple different adverse perinatal effects that are associated with each substance. And what I really want to point out is that if you just look at the total number of crosses, you will notice that tobacco and alcohol are licit substances, so non-illegal substances, are associated with far more adverse perinatal outcomes than the illicit substances are. Interestingly, though, I will not say that I think this is probably completely accurate because the study of the illicit substances is probably has not been done as much as the study of tobacco and alcohol during pregnancy has. So some of this I think is more of question marks instead of blanks in a lot of these associations. However, we do know that tobacco and alcohol are probably a lar larger concern of use during pregnancy than illicit substances. However, patients continue to use tobacco and alcohol during their pregnancy at much higher rates than they do illicit substances. So this slide is a slide that represents Garrett's Law in the state of Arkansas. And Garrett's Law states here in the state of Arkansas that if a pregnant woman or her newborn at the time of labor and delivery test positive for any illicit substance, social services or DHS need to be contacted and that social services or DHS is obligated to do an investigation. This is why universal drug screening is not recommended in pregnancy is because there are potential legal repercussions for women who are pregnant and using substances. In some states, Pregnant women can actually be imprisoned with charges pressed against them for using substances during their pregnancy. Pregnancy and substance use, we would hopefully would be a time to engage patients in treatment and 
we can't engage them if they are afraid of being locked up or being afraid of being judged to get treatment. So until the legal repercussions of drug abuse in pregnancy are non-existent, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology and most, um, most organizations do not recommend using urine, urine drug screens for universal screening. The one exception of this is in some hospitals, universal drug screening is done as part of routine prenatal care and patients are um, give permission and are informed that this is something we do routinely as part of prenatal care and we do it to every patient, not just the patients we pick and choose to do urine drug screens on. So that's one way some hospitals have got around it. But here at UAMS, they do not do routine urine drug screening at the prenatal visits. It's more verbal screening. Um, and at the labor and delivery here at UAMS, urine drug screens are also not done routinely on every pregnant patient. They are done with certain risk factors that are noticed by the providers, and they are also done with the patient's permission. So the patient has to give written permission to be able to do a urine drug screen on her. So here we are, we're looking at the state of Arkansas for the fiscal year 2015, 16, 17, and 18. And we notice that marijuana use is prevalent in about 65% of cases, and that has pretty much remained steady over that three, four year period, followed by amphetamines and methamphetamines, which is about 25%, and then opiates are third in line, which is just under 20%. I highlight these top three because this is what we're gonna spend the remainder of our time focusing on are these top three substances. And I chose these because they are the most prevalent. And I believe not only in the state of Arkansas, but if you were to look at many other states in the nation, these are the top three that would also be most prevalently used in pregnancy. So we're gonna focus our discussion on those moving forward. The other thing I wanna notice about this slide is that you'll notice that the number of reports for illicit substance abuse have increased over the past four years in Arkansas, as well as the number of drugs cited to be used. So maternal substance abuse and pregnancy is something that's becoming an increasing number of problems that need to be addressed. So starting with marijuana use in pregnancy, first, marijuana, generally the most commonly used illicit drug. And in fact, general use is increasing among all age groups. Why is this? Well, one, when people view a illicit drug as safe, they're more likely to use it. And they've done multiple studies and surveys and people are finding that marijuana use, they view it as safe. And so people are more likely to use it. It has also been legalized for medical and recreational purposes in many states. And that has also led to, A, the views that marijuana is safe because it's now legal, and then people use it often, um, use it above that as well. However, when we look at the data, looking at marijuana use in pregnancy, the data is insufficient. One, People, there's a reporting bias. People don't want to report that they use marijuana, so we're probably not, people aren't truthful um, with their reported use. Also, most studies here are done um, retrospectively, and people cannot recall the actual frequency of their use, the timing in their pregnancy of their use, because use in their first, second, and third trimester can all have different impacts, as well as how much they are using during that time can differ. And then lastly, the marijuana potency has increased over many, many, many years. And in fact, the Department of Health from Arkansas just put out a warning, I think in the last two or three weeks is when I saw it, that the potency of marijuana that was on the streets now is much higher than just even five years ago. So any even recent literature that we can look at does not really apply to the current marijuana that is found um, in the state or used here in the state. 
Of note, here in Arkansas, for those outside of Arkansas, we have recently legalized marijuana for medical purposes. Patients have been able to get their cards um, for medical marijuana, but the manufacturing and the distribution of marijuana is not operating yet. So, and I think it's been like two years. So, even though it's legal here, it's not really operating here yet. So, what are the issues with medical and or recreational marijuana or marijuana use in general in pregnancy? Well, one, despite I believe it's 30 states um, legalizing marijuana for multiple reasons. It still remains illegal by federal stand standards. So it is federally still illegal to use. Also, marijuana has not been regulated by the FDA. There are no approved indications, formulations, or dosages for marijuana on the streets, as we know to be used for any sort of mental or physical illness. And then with its use in pregnancy, we come into a few other issues. One, if you'll remember the chart that I showed a few slides ago, tobacco was highly associated with adverse perinatal events. And most of that is through the smoking. Um, and that's because tobacco includes over 2,000 carcinogens plus nicotine. And when you're smoking marijuana, you're also exposed to numerous carcinogens by smoking it. And for any reason, we cannot encourage smoking in pregnancy due to that association with multiple adverse events. We also know that marijuana use in general, marijuana is stored in your fat. So with chronic use, even after someone stops using marijuana, it remains in their system up to four weeks afterwards. And if a fetus is exposed to chronic use, it could it could possibly be in their system at least four weeks. If not, it could be less or it could be more. We don't fully know how an unborn fetus metabolizes marijuana in utero, but we do know it's stored in fat. So it's very possible that they would store it and it would cross the placenta as well and reach the fetus. So what has marijuana use in pregnancy been associated with? Well, one, hasn't really been associated with any specific birth defect. There's some evidence for and some evidence against, but we do know that marijuana use is associated with stillbirth, low birth weight among chronic users who are using at least once a week. We also know smaller birth length and head circumferences has been associated with marijuana use. And lastly, we saw one study that showed an increased risk of preterm delivery. However, that was only seen if they also used tobacco. So it really cannot be stated that that was secondary to marijuana use. It could have been the tobacco use. Or the combination of the two actually increased the risk. Of neonates who are exposed to marijuana in utero at delivery, there is no associated withdrawal seen in these babies. But later on, there are some problems associated. We know that marijuana use in utero in children or infants who are exposed in utero, later on they have lower test scores in visual problem solving, visual motor coordination, visual analysis, they have difficulty um, with attention spans. They have global deficits in learning and memory, and they also have behavior problems. Interesting, despite those mentioned issues, the, the effects on actual school performance have actually been inconsistent with some studies saying yes and some studies saying no, it does not impact that. And then lastly, we know that if your mom smoked marijuana in pregnancy with you that you are more likely to also start using marijuana by the age of 14. So what about moms who are using marijuana in their breastfeeding? Um, either during their pregnancy they used it all throughout or patients who want to restart once they have delivered. There is not data to support 
the safety of breastfeeding when you're using marijuana, thus it is not recommended. And this is pretty global recommendations here that if you're actively using marijuana, do not breastfeed your child. Before we move on, are there any questions about marijuana use in pregnancy or anything that's been talked about so far? Yeah, um, a couple of questions have um, come in. One was about um, the universal drug screen, and they're just kind of curious why it wouldn't be done at the prenatal appointments to help mom yeah. during pregnancy versus reactively after she has already been given birth. So um, to respond to that. So how so hopefully I address that with it's because of the legal ramifications. And this to give you an example, the state um, Tennessee that's just right to the east of Arkansas, they have actually imprisoned women who have been using drugs in their preg in their pregnancy and kept and prosecuted them for it. Um, and as long as that's an issue. In general, we don't feel it's the best thing to do because it's going to prohibit patients from coming forward and getting help and disclosing they use. And ultimately, it's going to prohibit them from getting OB care. And if they don't get OB care, they have an increased risk of having adverse events at labor and delivery. Um, and it's often, it's, so at delivery, the patients who are usually urine drug screened at delivery are patients who did not get prenatal care, or they're presenting with odd behaviors, or they have a history of substance abuse that's been documented in the chart, unfortunately. So that's kind of the answer is we just don't recommend doing it because there's legal ramifications in some areas. And here in the state of Arkansas, there was actually a pretty prominent case that happened um, a woman at birth was positive for methamphetamine and they prosecuted her based on after the baby was out but still attached before the umbilical cord was cut they said that she knowingly and intentionally provided her baby methamphetamine and then and she was put in prison and convicted on that it has since been overturned um, but that is you know, it's it's discouraging patients from getting care, basically. Okay. And um, one kind of another question that came in, um, and then we can probably uh, go on, was related to this slide that we're on now about breastfeeding. Um, mm -hmm. uh, one person writes that. So why are doctors not telling patients to pump and dump? Most doctors will tell their patients it's up to the mother what she does. Is that something you commonly hear as well, or thoughts about that? So. I cannot speak about other physicians. I can tell you what I tell my patients and what is per the um, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology recommendations, and that is not to breastfeed. And I think that that's what most lactation consultants are also going to tell you. And it is the ACOG guidelines not to breastfeed when you're using. Um, and pumping and dumping with marijuana use is also difficult because marijuana is stored in fat. So even using one, smoking one time, it's gonna stay in your system up to a week. If you're a chronic user, you've got four weeks. And that, that's based on just storage in fat. I don't know if there's actually been studies done looking at marijuana use and how it's translated into breast milk. Okay, so we'll move on. So next, we're going to move on to amphetamines or methamphetamines. And methamphetamines and amphetamines fall under the classification of stimulants, which include both prescription Schedule II drugs such as Adderall, Vyvanse, um, and these medicines are used for narcolepsy and ADHD. And then it also is the illegal use of methamphetamines off the street. For the purposes of this talk, I am primarily going to focus on the illicit use of methamphetamines or stimulants, not prescription. Um, for women who are on prescription stimulants for an approved medical condition, that's a more in-depth conversation of whether or not you should continue that medicine. And that's really a conversation that needs to be between you and your um, obstetrical provider as well as the person prescribing these medications, so whether that's your psychiatrist, your primary care doctor, et cetera. 
Um, we know that stimulant use or methamphetamines is really a problem that's been increasing lately. It started in the 90s and has really increased. Um, and one study looked at federally funded admissions for a pregnant women, and they found that the use of meth had increased three times from 1994 to 2006. Among my patients in my clinic, meth, uh, methamphetamine use is very prevalent um, and probably, probably after tobacco and opiates, the most next commonly used drug. So how does methamphetamine use in fact impact the pregnancy and the unborn child? Well, one, unfortunately, it's not well studied. Uh, and, and two, there really have been inconsistent data to support any association with birth defects. And one of the issues that we really have with studying methamphetamines is that the manufacturing of methamphetamines can be done numerous amount of ways with a lot of different chemical additives, and most people aren't quite sure what they're using when they're using methamphetamines. Um, women who are using methamphetamines have poor maternal weight gain, again, late prenatal care that I mentioned before. The babies have um, increased risk of low birth weight or being small for gestational age, as well as lower APGAR scores at one in five minutes. But we do know that those exposed to methamphetamine use in utero do not have an associated withdrawal syndrome associated with methamphetamine use in pregnancy. A lot of this, the poor maternal weight gain and the fetal low birth weight makes a lot of sense. When women use methamphetamines, it decreases their appetite and it keeps them awake so they're not taking care of themselves. So it's not, um, Kind of a no-brainer that these things were also found in studies. We move on to infant and child outcomes. The studies here are very, very limited. Um, we do know in the newborn, these patients will have, some of them will have decreased arousal, they're just easier to be stressed, and they don't really coordinate their movements as well as a newborn should. When they are a little bit older, they perform poorly on attention, visual motor integration, verbal memory, and long-term spatial memory. One of the things that's been consistently shown is methamphetamine use is associated with increased attention deficit disorders in children. But that, that data is very commonly compound, confounded by the parental history of ADHD disorders. So they're not quite sure if it's due to genetics or if it's due to the actual methamphetamine exposure in utero. Here again with breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is contraindicated in people who are actively using their um, methamphetamines and that's sort of one we don't know exactly what it does. The data that we do have shows that amphetamines will inhibit prolactin release thus decreasing breast milk supply, as well as these infants who are exposed to breast milk with methamphetamines display increased irritability, agitation, and crying. I simply tell my mom, you know, what is what does using meth, um, methamphetamines do? Well, it keeps you up and it takes your appetite away. Those are the two main side effects. Well, what do we want babies to do? We want babies to sleep and eat. So, of course, we do not recommend using methamphetamines while breastfeeding. Any questions before we move on? Um, one person asked, are there any particular areas of the brain that are impacted by the child or mother that maybe it depends on the cause so of that the is that? Yes, so that is an area that has not been well studied. And I know that it's an area that multiple people are being are that are interested in studying. And I know there's pulp, I know there just here in Little Rock there's some um, grants that are going in to actually look at that and try to do fMRIs of both mom during pregnancy as well as you can actually do one of a baby in utero. Um, and so there are some people who have done some work in that area, but it's not it's ongoing. It's not published. Thanks. Okay. 
go. There we go. Okay. So lastly, we're going to talk about opiates. Um, and I can, I've got a whole lecture spent on opiates um, in pregnancy, and that's because it's a personal interest and because it's the, where the nationwide opioid epidemic that we're in right now. So we're going to cover a lot of material pretty quickly. I may even skip over some of it, um, but we are going to move on to opiates. So what is the problem of opiates? So opiates in pregnancy have actually probably been have been studied a little bit better than the last two drugs that I mentioned. Um, and so we do know a little bit more about those in pregnancy. So in general, what has been shown for people just in pregnancy in general, what is your likelihood of getting an opiate prescription? Not chronic use of opiates, but just a single prescription. So in a 2007 study in Medicaid um, insured women, it showed that over 22% of pregnant women had received, it, uh, actually not just received, but filled an opioid prescription at some point in their pregnancy. That's one out of five women. And then a follow-up study to that looked at the commercially insured population and showed that it was a little lower there of about 14% of women had actually filled an opiate prescription in their pregnancy. In this last study, I'm gonna show you, this is a, gra um, a graph from or a figure from the last study where they actually looked at it by state. And down here in the edge or the legend, you'll see that the light graded light gray areas are lower use compared to the dark gray areas. Unfortunately, for the state of Arkansas, we're the top three states in the nation for opiate use during pregnancy, and our rate is somewhere between 20 to 26 percent of opiate use in pregnancy. Um, surrounding, and you can see in general, the kind of south um, east here is probably a little higher than a lot of other parts of the nation. We also know that opiate use during pregnancy is increasing. Neonatal absence syndrome is syndrome that is associated with in utero opioid exposure. And so studies have looked at how many babies are having neonatal absence syndrome at delivery. And this was a study that was put out in the past six months by the CDC that showed that we have really increased from about one case in 1,000 in 2001 as a nation all the way up to about six and a half cases per 1,000 deliveries in 2014. Here in Arkansas, 2004 was the first year we started collecting data and we were about 0.4 um, cases per 1,000 deliveries. And then in 2014, the last reported year, that had increased to about two. So we kind of mirror the nationwide increase of about six times. Um, increase in a matter of the past 10 years. So what are the impacts of opiate use on the pregnancy and the unborn child? Well, one, people who are actively using opiates, again, late, insufficient, poor prenatal care. Um, it's also associated um, with not taking care of yourself, increased risk of putting yourself in bad situations, as well as exposing yourself to increased risk of infection, including increased risk of overdose with opiate use. When you look at specifically the impact on the fetus, there have been really, there's been one study that showed an increased risk of cardiac defects. Another study showed an increased risk of neural tube defects. Neither one of these findings have been replicated in other studies, and there have been studies in general that have said no increased risk of birth defects. So that, um, the jury's still out on that decision. I will tell you routinely, they do not recommend additional folic acid with opiate use in pregnancy. And I usually discuss it with my patients and let them make the decision if they want to take additional folic acid to help prevent neural tube defects or not. 
Patients with opiate use in utero also are associated with increased risk of fetal growth restriction, placental eruption, fetal death, as well as preterm labor. And then one study showed that it increased the risk of intrauterine passage of meconium. So treatment options for opiate use disorder. One, patients oftentimes have to be detoxed, and this can be medically assisted in a hospital. They can also get inpatient substance abuse treatment, or lastly, there is medication-assisted treatment with an opioid agonist pharmacotherapy. With opiate use disorder, and as well as any substance abuse disorder during pregnancy, we really do need to address any co-occurring mental illness that's there, as well as treat any current nicotine or tobacco use. Opiate agonist pharmacotherapy with medication-assisted treatment is the ACOG guidelines. This is what they recommend for patients with an active opiate use disorder. They recommend that they get medication-assisted treatment with methadone or buprenorphine. Why? Well, we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, we'll get to specific, specific reasons of that here in a minute. So first, of the options, you can do medically assisted detoxification. Oftentimes, this is something that's chosen by our patients, um, and we bring them into the hospital, we detox them in the hospital, um, and this is basically chosen usually because they want to go to an inpatient substance abuse rehab, and they are required to be detoxed before they are admitted to the rehab. However, in general, detoxification is not recommended. Why is that? They have shown that these patients are more likely to relapse by the time they deliver at rates of 50% or some studies show even 70 or 80% of these women will relapse at delivery if they are detoxed without subsequent treatment. Also, when you detox anyone with an opiate use disorder, afterwards they're at an increased risk of overdose because you've kind of reset their tolerance for the drug. They will go out, they'll try to use their previous dose of opiates and they will accidentally overdose. We also know that if a woman detoxes and then relapses, this is related to worse perinatal outcomes later on. Rehab, sometimes this is the best option for patients. This would be a really good option for patients who have failed medication-assisted treatment or patients who are using multiple substances at one time and they need to address all substance use. But when choosing an inpatient substance rehab, you do have to consider certain conditions. One, how long is the rehab? Are they allowed to have their child there with them afterwards? What is the, are they still gonna be able to get obstetrical care there at the rehab? Um, there's a lot of different factors that have to be chosen. Um, if a patient is medically detoxed, I feel very strongly that this should be followed by inpatient rehab, and that's really the only time I recommend someone to be medically detoxed is if they plan on going straight to inpatient rehab after being medically detoxed. Here in Arkansas, we have specialized women's services, which are different organizations throughout the state that are designated to provide services and support for women with substance use disorder that are pregnant or parenting. And they often, they also have to include all these different services here that are listed. So for the pregnant woman who is using substances, including substance use disorder, this is often my first go-to is let's pull this list out and, you know, or in, can we get you into one of these specialized women's services? So a little bit about medication-assisted treatment. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail here, but basically what this does is it provides a long-term opioid that replaces what the patient is using off the street. And this long-term opiate usually is in their system once a day. It prevents them from doing that cycle of getting high, going into withdrawal, getting high, going into withdrawal. It provides a more stable, in utero environment for the fetus as well as for mom. It's been shown to improve adherence to prenatal care, which in turn means they have better obstetrical and perinatal outcomes. And when someone is receiving medication-assisted treatment, it's not simply the medication. 
The other and the most important part is the counseling and behavioral therapy that goes along with opioid agonist therapy. The one downside to medication-assisted treatment is neonatal abstinence syndrome, and that is the withdrawal syndrome, withdrawal syndrome that is seen with opiate exposure in utero, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit more. Um, opiate agonist therapy can be can be provided with either methadone or buprenorphine. Methadone is provided through a licensed outpatient program that is federally run, and that a patient has to go six out of seven days a week there to be dosed with the medicine, while buprenorphine can be provided with any physician that has been wavered, and that requires a little bit of um, training to do so, and then a special certification from the DEA. It's becoming more common just because it's going to be more accessible to patients. There are some um, issues with buprenorphine compared to methadone, vice versa. In general, the one study that compared the two showed that buprenorphine had actually better outcomes for mom and baby. However, methadone is associated with better compliance. So the patients were more likely to stay in treatment on methadone but buprenorphine actually had better perinatal outcomes for mom and baby. Okay. So what do we know about how opiate use disorder impacts the infant and child long term? Unfortunately, we don't know the answer to this. And for the person who asked earlier about brain imaging or brain findings, this is where I know a lot of research is being put into right now. It's following the moms who are medication-assisted treatment and their babies, following them throughout and over years to actually look at that question. So I hate to say it, but maybe in the next 10 years, we'll actually have some more data to actually show this. There was one study that looked them up um, that followed the infants or children up to five years of age, and they found no significant differences in cognitive development. And that, interestingly, in the women that I treat, they often ask me, what are the impacts of this treatment on my child? Um, they do, they want to know, and they care, too. Like, what am I doing to my baby? Um, and unfortunately, the answer is we don't know in the long term. We know in the short term getting treatment is the best option, but we don't know the true impacts long term. So neonatal abstinence syndrome, or NAS, this is how it's been relatively referred to in the literature. Some more recent literature will actually refer to it as neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome, or NOW. Um, and this is a syndrome that's prevalent with any in utero exposed opiate, or in utero exposed baby to opiates whether it is being in treatment with a medication as a treatment medication like buprenorphine or methadone, or it's illegal use off the street, such as oxycodone, roxies, um, or heroin. A baby is at risk of having this either or. At birth, all opioid-exposed neonates should be monitored for signs and symptoms of NAS. Typical monitoring is anywhere from three to five days after delivery. Interestingly, NAS is actually a syndrome that we see with a lot of other medications as well, um, but most, in, most frequently it's associated with opioids. Um, what is NAS or now? Well, these babies are fussy, they don't eat well, they have diarrhea, they don't sleep well, they're, they're, not, they're not fun to take care of and it can be really taxing on new moms with a baby with NAS. Breastfeeding can be encouraged if the patient is sober and stable on medication-assisted treatment, not using other drugs, they have no other contraindications. However, if a patient relapses onto illicit drugs, then breastfeeding should be suspended during that period. Okay. Any questions about that? I see we've got about five minutes left. I've got a little bit more information to give, um, but we may not get to it. Yeah, and there's there's been a number of questions come in that okay. I'll prob we'll probably ha we'll probably handle those offline just because they're more okay. specific. So I think if you just want to continue, that's fine. Okay. So when I was preparing this lecture, I thought 
what are most people probably going to want to know about? Well, I know AR best, y'all deal a lot with trauma. And I just wanted to give an insight or maybe a, this could start a discussion here with, well, what does trauma mean in this population? Well, in this population, we have the infant or the child who's been exposed to medications in utero, which is probably traumatic. We also have the mom who has a history of trauma as well. And in fact, in our, the WMHP is our program here, the Women's Mental Health Program. In one of our recent studies that we looked at, we found that over 45% of our women are diagnosed with PTSD. Even more of that have trauma. These are just the women who were actually diagnosed with PTSD. And that was done based on a skid, a structured clinical interview. So it is a it is a true diagnosis there. So you've got a woman who has either PTSD or at least trauma exposure during her pregnancy, who if she's in treatment may actually be decreasing her exposure to trauma. However, if she's continuing to use, she's a P, you know, she's a woman who's already been exposed to trauma, who's undergoing ongoing trauma exposure, as well as then she has an infant um, that, and a child that she has to raise or other children at home that are also being exposed to the same trauma that she is undergoing. And it's just, I hands off to you who handle, who work in that area because it's something I can't do, but there's just so many levels here to the trauma that I just thought it was important to actually, you know, to point out here that, Y'all are y'all are doing some work that I probably can't do, but something to think about. Um, but lastly, I wanted to tell you a little bit about our program in case you're wondering and going, how do I get patients in with you? I know patients who um, need to come see you. Um, so who are we? It's myself, my colleague Jessica Coker is also here. We have a, um, a nurse in our program as well, some research assistants. They help us. Um, what do we do in the Women's Mental Health Program? So we manage general psychiatric issues during pregnancy and postpartum. Uh, and the obstetrical services here at UAMS are our primary source of referrals, but we are open to referrals throughout the state from both private and um, private and academic providers. Um, we really focus on pregnancy and postpartum though. So really those two periods is the patients we want. We also treat substance use disorders uh, during pregnancy and we have a program on Tuesdays in which we do that. And we do offer medication assisted treatment with buprenorphine. We also offer inpatient detoxification if the patient wants that during pregnancy. We do that on our women's unit here at UAMS. And then my favorite thing to do is actually to see the mom before they get pregnant when they're thinking about it. And let's talk about your medications and your risk at that point. So we do do some preconception consultation for patients. So enough of how, what we do, where do we do it? Well, we do it here at the PRI on the, which is the Psychiatric Research Institute connected to the main university hospital on the outpatient, the fourth floor. We're also integrated in the obstetrical clinics here at UAMS two half days a week. So how do you get an appointment to us? Well, one, we do require the patients to contact us. We do not take referrals from physicians, but we want patients to contact us. So you simply give the patient the phone number here and tell them to call. We accept all insurances as well as self-pay. And we are also, Dr. Coker and I are on call 24-7 via the ANGELS hotline for anyone to call with questions or concerns about a patient. And these are the numbers there, both locally and greater that you need to, that you can reach us at. And we also publish guidelines per the ANGELS that are available online as well for a variety of mental health or substance use issues during pregnancy. Okay, I think I'm out of time. <laughs> um, I had one more slide, but I think we're out of time. So I think that's where I'm going to end here. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Ray. I'm just going to advance it for folks that have to leave okay. to um, the CE slide. Um, so again, if you're interested in getting a CU, the code for today's webinar is DRUG. Uh, my email is displayed there. 
Um, it's helpful if you tell me your first and last name. It just makes uh, it easier for me to look you up. Um, and so thank you again. So I'll have this up here for Um, a little bit um, come in about the preconception interview um, does yes. that include mental health concerns yes so that's primarily what it is so if I have someone who has got a history of bipolar disorder and they're thinking about starting a family um, within the next year that is definitely someone I want through my doors and I want to talk about their options and get their history and that's really what I like to do um, and if they're interested, they just need to call and say, hey, I'm thinking about getting pregnant. Can I get an appointment? And we'll set them up. And we also, um, we're probably the only psychiatry clinic in town or in the state. Our wait list is less than a month. So we can get you in wow. within usually two or three weeks. Yeah. Wow. Um, um, and then a lot of folks have asked about, uh, could we make this um, presentation available um, Hand it out to them after the webinar. Would that be okay? Oh, yes, that is fine. Okay. Um, and so those of you who are still on, I'll um, usually after a webinar, I usually kind of email you know, some resources that were mentioned, and I'll include a um, uh, this this uh, PowerPoint attachment. And I know several folks also mentioned the specialized women's services uh, clinics mm -hmm. around the state. I can provide a yes. list of those or a, a place that to find that information out. So. Um, we'll get that to you uh, after today's webinar. Um, and, and then just lastly, uh, this also was kind of a hot, several folks had asked about this, um, and I know it wasn't okay. your uh, focus, Dr. Ray, but uh -huh. nursing and nursing and alcohol. Um, pump and dump, uh, well, one beer is oh. okay. Like what's kind of yeah. the, that, so that just alcohol, got kind of asked about. Yeah, so alcohol is very interesting um, in breast milk. So alcohol actually, or breast milk and alcohol are actually equivalent. So whatever your blood alcohol level is currently, that's what the blood alcohol level, or that's what the breast milk alcohol level is. So if you want, if you're breastfeeding and say you want to have a drink, it is actually okay to pump and dump at that point. So if you're feeling the effects of alcohol and you breastfeed your infant at that point, your infant is going to get the same level of alcohol that's in your current system. So you can actually pump and dump at that point and then 12 hours later safely breastfeed as long as you're not going on a binger. <laughs> um, but if you wanted to have one or two drinks that night, you could simply pump and dump and not breastfeed while you have the blood alcohol in your level at that point and then resume breastfeeding the next day. So that is Hopefully the that's one, that's the one, yeah. it, that's kind of the one exception to a lot of this no breastfeeding, no exceptions if you're using illicit or illicit drugs. Great. I'm hearing a lot of, uh, seeing a lot of thank yous for clearing that up. And um, and I just want to thank you, Dr. Ray, for this very informative um, webinar. Um, and thank you, everyone. We've had a lot of questions come in, and I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone, but we'll sort of like handle those offline because um, some of them were pretty specific. So, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll try our best to, to follow up with you um, here shortly. So I'll, I'll leave this slide up for 30 seconds or more, let folks get it down. And um, just thank you again, Dr. Ray. Thank you.